I'm just sitting there thinking, Lord, let it stop. <laughs> Please. My powers of intercession are weak right now because it just kept going and going. No. Good morning, everyone. I know you're Canadian, I know the cultural sub subtleties, but I just have a little bit of American expectation that you would say good morning back. That's it. <laughs> End of the day, nothing else. No, it is great to be with you, and I'm um, here with my 14-year-old son. Where are you, Moses? In the back there, thoughts you. But very happy to be with you. Thank you to Jason and Chris and the leadership here for the invitation to come, I have the utmost respect, if not for their video skills, for their in-person life. And uh, the utmost respect for them and vicariously for you. And I've been hearing such glowing reviews about you as a community from your leaders. You know, when pastors get together, we're, we're, we're very human, as you all know. And so there is a little bit of the dynamic of like parents of teenagers getting together to gripe. And it just, it happens. Pastors complain. And I wish you could hear how your leaders speak about you. It is, it is not that way. Maybe that's just because you're a new church and give them six more months. But um, we'll see. It's great to be with you. Please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. And stand with me, please, for the reading of Scripture. We stand because we... Are a body, we know just have a body, our body is part of who we are, and we want to, with our body, honor God and honor the story that we are about to read as more than just literature. It is that, it's not less, but as the word of God that is coming to us. Mark chapter 9, let's read from verse 14. And God, we just open our heart now to you. I invite you all just to take a deep breath in and out. As it is written in James, to receive the word planted humbly in you that can save you. When they came to the other disciples, they saw a large crowd around them and the teachers of the law arguing with them. As soon as all the people saw Jesus, they were overwhelmed with wonder and ran to greet him. What are you arguing with them about, he asked. A man in the crowd answered, teacher, I brought you my son who is possessed by a spirit that has robbed him of speech. Whenever it seizes him, it throws him to the ground. He foams at the mouth, gnashing his teeth and becomes rigid. I asked your disciples to drive out the spirit, but they could not. You unbelieving generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy to me. So they brought him. When the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the boy into a convulsion. He fell to the ground and rolled around, foaming at the mouth. Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered, it has often thrown him into fire or water to kill him, but if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus, everything is possible for one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. When Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the spirit. You deaf and mute spirit, he said, I command you, come out of him and never enter him again. The spirit shrieked, convulsed him violently, and came out. The boy looked so much like a corpse that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he stood up. Take a seat. Any literary types in the room? No pressure if you're not, but any of you read a novel once in a while? Pulitzer Prize to Hunger Games, we accept all here. Hunger Games is actually quite good, not the movie, but have you read it? I read widely, it's quite good. Um, I read a lot, I read before bed every single night, and it's the best drug I've found for insomnia. It works quite well. 
and no side effects other than random stories that you tell people like the one I'm about to tell you now. I had a mentor of mine recommended an obscure novel called Island of the World to me by a Catholic writer, Michael O'Brien. Beautiful, not that obscure. <laughs> one literary type in the house. Let's have coffee after. Beautiful, haunting story about a man named Joseph, a Bosnian man who just kind of goes through several decades under communist Yugoslavia. And in it, there's this interaction that as I was reading, just cut to the core of my heart between the protagonist, this man Joseph, who's just been through horror after horror, and this mysterious kind of an angel kind of figure on this, just a random stranger on the side of the road. Let me just read you the excerpt. In your life, Joseph, you will have much to fear. In time, you will come to a length of days and wisdom and goodness. You will suffer, and this suffering will bring much good to others. I do not understand what you are saying. You do not need to understand. Only remember, you will be afraid, but do not be afraid. What can this mean? Tell me what it means. You will be afraid, but when you are afraid, do not be afraid. I'm essentially living through a freely chosen midlife crisis. I'm about to turn 43 years old next week after 20 years of church planting and pastoring, as Jason said, in Portland. I stepped down from the lead pastor role to start this new nonprofit. We moved down to California for a kind of family gap year on the beach with our mentors, and we're about to move again to settle in LA. And our whole future is kind of a little bit up in the air. As you can imagine, pretty much any fear that could come up in my heart has come up over the last few years. Now, we all have fear that we carry in our body. And fear, all fear is, is the anticipation of possible evil. And God designed a fear impulse in our nervous system, I, I think, as an act of love to keep your body and your life safe from harm. Studies have been done on people with brain damage who no longer have the capacity for fear. And you would think, that sounds amazing. The stories are not of bliss, but of sheer horror. But whether you ascribe to Christian theology or evolutionary biology or some mishmash of both, it's no secret that something has gone deeply wrong in our body's relationship to fear. You could say it is fallen in Christian language. I have come to believe that fear is at the root of almost all our problems in the spiritual life. That's a strong claim. Why would I say that? Because the telos, or the end goal of the spiritual journey in the way of Jesus, as defined by Jesus himself, is to become a person of love. And it is written, and you'll recognize 1 John here, there is no fear in love. As long as we need our life to go a certain way, we will, despite our best intentions, which all of us have, act in ways that are unloving to anyone who gets in our way. Therefore, fear is at the root of all sin. And faith is, at some level, the ultimate solution. Early on in the pandemic, remember that? Um, someone in the American South coined this phrase, faith over fear, which, nice alliteration, thank you, but it became a kind of rally cry for the anti-lockdown movement, and as a result, just kind of more polarizing language in the culture wars. Now, you may hate that language, you may have it on a bumper sticker on your car outside, I don't care, that's between you and the leadership here, all right? That's, <laughs> that's their problem, not mine. Um, I'm not referring to where you fall on the political spectrum, but how far along you are on the spiritual journey. The theologian and psychologist Benedict Groeschel summarizes the entirety of the spiritual journey in the way of Jesus as a decrease in fear and an increase in faith. As the gradual shift over a lifetime from what Jesus called anxious care to a deep, genuine, sturdy trust in God. 
That's essentially what faith is. The word faith um, is pistis in Greek, the language of the New Testament. And pistis is one in a constellation of Greek words that kind of are all in what linguists call a semantic domain, kind of a range of meaning. Faith, along with words like belief, trust, confidence, reliance, allegiance, faithfulness. All of these English words orbit around the center of gravity in biblical theology, that is, faith, which is best defined as confidence grounded in reality. Faith, contrary to popular opinion, is not a blind leap into the dark. It is not believing something for which there is no evidence, but believing something based on evidence. As the Quaker Elton Trueblood, who was the chaplain at Stanford for many years, once said, faith is not belief without proof, but trust without reservations. Faith is not a feeling, though it has an emotional component to it of trust. More on that in a minute. And faith is certainly not just mental assent, which was the fatal flaw, if you know your church history, of the Protestant Reformation, which redefines saving faith as, at a crass level, believing the right doctrines about God. It has to do with what we believe, but faith is an action. It is something you do. You put your faith in God. And faith is at the center of our discipleship to Jesus and all Christian spirituality. To the point we call our worldview the Christian what? Faith. A practice dating all the way back to the New Testament itself where Paul and Peter and others call Christian spirituality, quote, the faith. And the first thing you need to understand about faith is that it is not a religious thing. It is a human thing. Whether you are here this morning and you are an ardent disciple of Jesus or you're a Buddhist or you're a Muslim or you're an atheist or agnostic, all of us live by faith because it's impossible not to. Again, faith is a sense of trust or reliance on someone or something. I got up early this morning. I've been in town all week doing a, a couple of work things earlier in the week, and I had a day or two uh, with, with nothing on the schedule, and so I'd never been to Whistler, and I moved away from the rain and with it away from all the trees. And so I thought, and it's, it's a mixed bag. Sun, you can have sun and no trees, or you can have trees and no sun. You chose trees and no sun. So um, there you have it. And so I missed the trees. So we went up for a few days, my son and I, to the Whistler area. That drive, by the way, is beautiful. I just got out of the car. I woke up early this morning. Dan was kind enough to, to loan me his car. Thank you so much to both of you because I lost my license and um, I went to take the test and I failed it. So I can't rent a car right now. So I borrowed Dan's. Thank you, Dan. It's a true story. True story. Um, point of the story is, I got up early this morning, and I calculated the time to drive from our Airbnb, Airbnb, I had to be here at 8.40 this morning, and I left right on time, and I did not wake up stressed, is this car going to start? Dan gave it to me, it's a reasonably new looking Honda, I just trusted I, I just trusted the car will probably, I didn't schedule an Uber as a backup. I didn't have three other cars waiting in the parking garage just in case. I just decided to put my faith in Dan and his car. Now, do I know that the car was going to start? Do I have irrefutable proof that that car was, no, I had no idea. I just had, based on some, you know, somewhat sufficient evidence in Dan's sketchy reputation, I had enough faith, I'm kidding, I had enough faith that that car would start and get me to my destination this morning. I was living by faith, and so are you, whether you are, again, a disciple of Jesus or not. Even at the meta level of meaning and purpose in life, let's go way beyond, like, trust in a car to get you somewhere. Who am I? What's the meaning and purpose of life? The question is not, do you have faith? It's who or what do you put your faith in? Jesus or Richard Dawkins or a particular interpretation of the data points of science or somebody on Instagram or just your own intuition and street smarts. Here's the Christian philosopher James K.A. Smith, a favorite of mine. The question isn't whether you're going to believe, but who. It's not merely about what to believe, but who to entrust yourself to. Do you really want to trust yourself? 
Do we really think humanity is our best bet? Do we really think we are the answer to our problems, we who've generated all of them? Hence, the invitation of Jesus is to put our faith in him, in his story, in his life, in his teachings, in his miracles, in his example, in his death on the cross on our behalf, his resurrection, his ascension to the right hand of the Father, and his coming again. Now, one of the things I regularly hear from people that are not yet followers of Jesus, but are drawn to Jesus, it's hard not to be, but they're just not there yet. In particular, if you live a place like Vancouver, it's really hard to get over that leap, that hump. One of the things I hear regularly is, I just wish I had your faith. And I get that. But here's the thing, faith is not something you have or you don't have, it is something you grow in over time. Faith in New Testament theology is one of what theologians call the three, three theological virtues, along with hope and love. They are called the theological virtues for a reason. Theological meaning faith in the Christian sense does not make sense apart from God. And virtue, meaning, again, faith is not a feeling, it is the shape of your inner woman or man. As you apprentice under Jesus over many years, you become more and more, you are formed into a person of faith, a person with a growing and real trust and confidence in the person of Jesus. And faith, just like any other virtue, patience or wisdom or courage, must be developed over time. Faith is like a muscle. We grow it through a kind of resistance training. Like a baby, all of us, when we become followers of Jesus, start out with weak faith, and every obstacle we face in life is a chance to trust God and let him work out our faith muscle to grow stronger. You see this on display in really mature disciples of Jesus. Do you know anyone? Daryl's a beautiful example. Anyone in their 70s or 80s or 90s who has been following Jesus seriously since before pretty much any of us in the room were alive. As a general rule, how many of them do you know that are really stressed out a lot? It's hard to find an 89-year-old disciple of Jesus who is anything other than calm, peaceful, relaxed, present, and full of joy. Because over many years, over decades, they have traveled the spiritual journey from fear to faith. Now, here's the question for you this morning. What is the landscape of such a journey? I'm a firm believer in what I call spiritual cartography, which is just kind of an attempt to map the spiritual journey over the arc of a life, the Christian analog to what secular academics would call developmental psychology or stage theory. For an apprentice of Jesus, the goal is to plot yourself on such a map in order to better name Jesus' warnings and invitations to you at each stage of the journey. To that end, let me offer you a map for the development of faith. You could call this three levels of faith, since we millennials love to level up. This paradigm is not chapter and verse, um, but I would argue you could overlay it over pretty much any biopic in scripture. If I had time, we would go through the life of Job, or Moses would be another good example, but also David or Paul, take your pick. Level one is the faith of religion. Um, if you're familiar with the story of Job, or if you're a new Christian, Job, this is, uh, <laughs> it's what the word is. Don't feel bad at all. That's like insider info to know the right pronunciation on that one. This is Job at the beginning of his story, or it's Paul on the road to Damascus. It's where all of us start, the faith of religion. The word religion gets a bad rap. It's used by a lot of Christians as a polemic against a particular kind of religion that is heavy on rules and light on relationship, hence the evangelical cliche, it's not a religion, it's a relationship, which is patently untrue, but it sounds really nice. But religion is best defined as a set of beliefs that explain what life is all about, who we are, and how we should live. Again, by this definition, all people are religious. You can't not be. 
Your religion may be Christianity, or it may be Islam, or Christian science, or politics, or social justice, or all things LGBTQ, or sports, or your career, or your family. It could be anything, good or bad, you name it. But in discipleship to Jesus, the faith of religion is essentially a way of relating to God that is based on quid pro quo. If I fill in the blank, then God will fill in the blank. If I put my faith in Jesus, then I will go to the good place when I die. If I tithe, then God will bless me financially. If I have integrity, then I will do well at work. If I don't have sex before marriage, then God will make me have an awesome marriage. In evangelicalism, the catchphrase for this first level of faith is biblical principles for living, which are great. For the record, I am all for biblical principles for living. But left unchecked, they can become an attempt to use God and insider information of his ways, the way he designed the universe to flourish, to engineer the circumstances of our life to our desired end, not his. Just another human attempt to minimize pain and maximize pleasure, but this time under the guise of Christianity. This is Book of Proverbs level of faith. Most people don't realize, you know, there's all this kind of internet-like stuff about can we trust the Bible, and there are great questions there to sit with before God. Uh, I've come to the conclusion, yes. But what people do not realize is that there was way less controversy in history around the canonization of Scripture, or which books were included in the canon or not, because early on, and for both the Old Testament and the New, there was a wide consensus around which writings had that special quality as well as strict criteria. But few Christians today are aware that one of the most hotly debated books, very contested in the ancient world, um, that almost did not make it into the canon was the book of Proverbs. Can you believe, have you read the book of Proverbs? Who could have a thing against the book of Proverbs? I mean, come on, there are other books. I'm like, really, are we sure about this one? (laughs) But Proverbs, and here's why. If you read Proverbs as a book of general wisdom principles, it is incredibly insightful. But if you read it as timeless truth, or even more so as a book of promises, they simply aren't true. I mean, they are true about 80% of the time, but that 20% of the time will kill you. One I made all my kids memorize early on because I'm a controlling father, is lazy hands make for poverty, but diligent hands bring about wealth. We used to say to our kids, do you have lazy hands or diligent hands? The answer was lazy, but what we were going for was diligent. (laughs) But our generation is incredibly aware of the generations and centuries of systemic injustice that have made many lazy people rich and many diligent people poor. It's not that that proverb's not true, but it is no promise. There are many diligent people that have never been on the receiving end of their hard work. At some point, this formulaic approach to God will fail you. A crisis will come, and guess what? God will not save you from it. Or you will do the right thing, and instead of being rewarded for it, you will be punished for it. Or you will go through a long season of pain and suffering with no idea where God is and what he is doing. And maybe down the road, hindsight, you'll say dot, 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 and maybe you'll live with the mystery until eternity. When that crisis comes, not if, but when, you have three options. Not to oversimplify, but option one, you step back from faith. Not on this stage, you don't. (laughs) You step back. You fall away in the language of the New Testament. This is one cause behind the emotionally vulnerable and complex phenomenon of deconstruction right now. Many people, and I say this with kindness, but many people, in particular many millennials, never mature beyond the faith of religion. And as Jesus said, quote, when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Do you have any friends who have quickly fallen away? 
one new idea trending on Twitter and three weeks later they're not sure if they're a Christian. Those roots do not go deep, quickly fall away. That's one option, you step back. Option two is you step aside and you compartmentalize your faith. You kind of put faith in Jesus and church and the way over here and then all of the rest of your life and your career and your finances or whatever over here and you just live with that cognitive dissonance. This is the seedbed of nominal Christianity. People that have made peace with something you should never make peace with is, and that is a lack of integration between your discipleship to Jesus and the whole of your life. And they've just found a way to just kind of go to church, put it in a box, and then go be a Canadian or an American the rest of the week. Option, that wasn't an insult to clarify. I would have said an American if I was in America. I guess it is kind of an insult, but you know, I'm equal to both nations. <laughs> Option, th I just got a laugh from a Canadian church. I must be doing okay, thank you. Option three is you step up to the next level of faith. That is, if you're taking notes, the faith of desperation. This is the faith that's called for in a crisis when the direct interven intervention of God is your one and only hope. When the death sentence comes for your young daughter and it is, it, it's, a, it's a death sentence. God is your only hope. When you get the phone call and it's worst case scenario, when your prayer is unanswered, when your plan falls through, when your dream dies, when the relationship is over, when you are forced to admit it is a failure, when your deepest fear comes true, when you are in the dark night of the soul or in the wilderness, it is the faith of the man here in the story in Mark chapter 9. He's at this breaking point. I mean, many of you are not yet parents, but I cannot even fathom what that would have been like. His son is demonized. He has exhausted every possible solution. He has no control over the situation. The beautiful proverb, train up a child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. That's not going to cut it when your son is foaming on the, at the mouth and rolling around possessed by a demon. You can't claim that like something has gone wrong. His only hope is a miracle. So what does he do? He goes to Jesus in weak but real faith. Look again at verse 22 if your Bible is still open. He says, if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. I just love the honesty of this man's prayer. And what does Jesus say? If you can? It's like a leading question. Notice he's, he's coaxing the man up. Can you come up with me to a higher level of faith? calling on this man to believe in the power of God and the possibility of life by the Spirit in the kingdom of God. You see, as uncomfortable as I am with it, and this is not how I would design the universe, and there are so many reasons that's a good thing that I'm not in charge of that, but there is a reciprocal relationship between our level of faith and our experience of the release of God's power. Now, behind that claim is all sorts of theological mystery and controversy, but let's just be honest, there's truth in that statement. There is some kind of correlation between how our level of faith, how much faith we have in God, and how much we see the move of God in our life. John Wimber used to say, faith is spelled R-I-S-K. He wasn't really bad at spelling. That was like a boomer pun, all right? He was saying, we have to risk, we have to step out in faith if we want to see God move in power. One of the reasons so few people, in particular upwardly mobile, creative class, people like many of you in the room in a city like Vancouver or Portland or LA, have so few stories of the hand of God in their life is because we live with such extraordinary control over the circumstances of our life. We have done everything in our power. We've worked hard. We've gone to school. We've gotten the right job. We've been good with our money or not or whatever to design this perfectly safe little life that we can control. And then we're up in our head and we don't know if we believe in God and where is God in my life? You've never even given him a chance. God comes to us in our vulnerabilities, in our pain, in our sufferings, when we are stripped of control, when we are no longer the captain of our ship and the master or the masters of our destiny, when we are humans, broken, weak, desperate, contingent, in need. You meet people like that, which is most of the world, and they're not up in their head wondering if they believe in God. They're full of their heart telling you stories of the power of God in their life. There is a relationship 
between our level of faith, vulnerability, risk, how much we're living at the edge, the margins of our Western control, and our experience of God. But some of you, this man here is risking heartache. He's risking yet another wave of disappointment, social stigma and an honor-shame culture. I'm sure many of you get that. He's risking things getting worse, like poking the bear. He's risking all of this in the faith of desperation. Some of you are at this point, I'm guessing, this morning. I don't know if it's 20 of you or two of you. or Maybe your faith is strong. Maybe it's weak. Maybe like the man, you just got to, I love Pete Gregg's word, pray what you got. I love his prayer. I cannot tell you. It's like the anthem cry of Christians in secular cities. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. I believe. Help my faith that is so weak. And watch what God does. Now, in this story, there's a happy ending. And part of me would love to just end right now. Let's believe for God. Let's go into some really loud song and go for it. Because that's the end of the story. The boy is set free. And I pray that same release of God's power for any of you in a crisis right now. My heart is with you. But what, what if he wasn't? Hypothetical scenario, and I'm not trying to play fast and loose with the text, but what if this man's story ended like Jesus' story? Where in his crisis, Jesus prayed, Father, take this cup from me, and heaven was quiet. And on the cross, he prayed, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the sky went black. You see, there is an even higher level of faith than the faith of desperation, which can be easy to miss, in particular if you're in the charismatic tradition, as you are, as I am, not a dig at all. In our tradition or our stream of the church, there's so much emphasis on stirring up faith to believe in God for the miraculous. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Good thing. But it's easy to miss inside that culture that the faith to believe for signs, for wonders, for the power of God, that's a beautiful thing. That's not the highest level of faith. The, there is a higher level still. That is what I would call the faith of surrender. This is where you aren't believing in God for any particular outcome. You're just believing in God. Whatever happens. Your trust isn't God will make everything okay. Okay. Your trust is God is good and God is with me no matter what happens. That's different. That's higher. It's Jesus, the pinnacle of spiritual maturity. Not my will, but what? Yours be done. Or it's Job at the end of his story. My eyes have seen the Lord. Now I repent in dust and ashes. No more questions. No more demands. I accept the the mystery my eyes have seen the Lord. It's Paul in prison waiting for a verdict that will either set him free or cut his head off. For me, to live is Christ, to die is what? Gain. He goes on and basically says, my only prayer is that, quote, Christ may be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. How many of you prayed that this morning? (laughs) I prayed every morning. No. Now, this doesn't mean that you and I don't have desires for a particular outcome. All of us do. Please do not shame yourself for that. All of us desire to minimize pain and maximize pleasure, and we strategically work to make it happen. It means that you're not emotionally attached in an unhealthy way to your desires. You see, this struggle with what psychologists call attachments what Tim Keller and the best of the Reformed tradition called idols of the heart. This struggle is at the root of all of our fear. It is the source of it. As the saying goes, our our anxieties reveal our attachments. What we're anxious about, what we worry about, what we lie awake at night thinking about, what we ruminate on and get stressed about and frantically you know, try to control reveals what we think and feel we need to be happy and at peace. 
The Indian Jesuit writer Anthony DeMillo said it this way, if you look carefully, you will see that there is one thing that causes unhappiness. The name of that thing is attachment. What is an attachment? An emotional state of clinging caused by the belief that without some particular thing or some person, you cannot be happy. An attachment is not a desire. It's an emotional state of clinging to a desire. It's not wanting something. It's needing that desire to be fulfilled in order to be okay. Our attachments, or again, in more traditional Christian language, our idols promise us peace and happiness, but they give us anxiety and heartbreak because all of our attachments can and at some point will be stripped away if not by a crisis or a betrayal or a failure or a pandemic or a recession or whatever, if nothing else, by old age and by death. It's a matter of when, not if. The paradox of Jesus' teaching, and you see this especially in the Sermon on the Mount, I'm thinking Matthew 6 here, is as long as you need your life to go a certain way to be happy and at peace, you will never be happy and at peace. Therefore, one way to think of the spiritual journey is as of a slow burning off of our attachments to all that is not Jesus. The final state, um, this may be right, it may not be right. It's just an interesting thought. And in particular with the Desert Fathers and Mothers, if you're familiar with them, or most of the church fathers from the first several centuries of the church would say the, the highest state of spiritual maturity, the end of of the spiritual formation road is what they called, uh, it was this Greek word apatheia. It's hard to translate into English. It can be translated peace or serenity or detachment or freedom. Saint Ignatius called it indifference or another translation that he used the Spanish word is the word freedom. It's where you reach this stage in your discipleship to Jesus where you are free of the emotional need for your life to go a certain way to be happy and at peace. His first principle and his very famous spiritual exercises, and again, don't worry if you're new to the Jesus thing, you're like, a saint who? A really important, smart person from a long time ago who said some very helpful things. He said this, we should not fix our desires on health or sickness, wealth or poverty, success or failure, a long life or a short one, for everything has the potential of calling forth in us a deeper response to our life in God. Our only desire and our one choice should be this, I want and I choose what better leads to God deepening his life in me. One more example, this is uh, called the Bookmark Prayer from St. Teresa of Avalia, 16th century Spanish mystic, Carmelite nun. They called it her Bookmark Prayer because when she died, her fellow nuns found it handwritten on a bookmark in the middle of her Bible. She would pray this every day. Let nothing disturb you. Let nothing make you afraid. All things pass, but God is unchanging. Patience is enough for everything. You who have God lack nothing. God alone is sufficient. This, whether you call it apatheia or whatever you want to call it, is the ability to calmly hold in your mind the reality of your life and to be grateful, content, and at peace in Jesus. This is the highest level of faith. Not faith that everything will work out perfectly, but faith that no matter what happens, whether I live through a miracle like the man in Mark 9 or like Jesus, my worst pain comes true. We are with Jesus. He's enough. No one and nothing can take his presence from us, and so we do not need to be afraid. And when you are afraid... Do not be afraid. So to recap, level one, the faith of religion. Level two, the faith of desperation. Level three, the faith of surrender. Where are you 
in your journey. Now, how do we mature in our faith? How do we level up? How do we go forward and exercise that faith muscle? Well, very quickly, we mature in two basic ways. Again, oversimplification, but through what our spiritual ancestors called active spirituality and passive spirituality. It's ancient language, not modern. I still find it very helpful. Active spirituality is where it feels like you and I take the initiative, like if we don't do it, it won't happen. It's our part in our spiritual formation. It's things like spiritual disciplines or coming to church or reading scripture in the morning. Passive spirituality is where it feels more like God takes the initiative. It's God's part in our formation. All we can do is either cooperate and say yes or resist and rebel. At an active level, there are a few things that you and I can do to grow in our faith. Here's a few examples. One, step out in faith. Risk, even if just a tiny little bit. Willard was once asked, how do you become a saint? And he said, by doing the next right thing. Is there one small step you can take this week? Something that you likely already feel the Spirit of God stirring in your heart. It could be the smallest thing. You bring cookies to your next door neighbor or whatever. Could you do that? Could you risk a little or a lot? Step out in faith. Secondly, practice gratitude. Gratitude is one of the best ways to overcome fear because gratitude is the practice of being present to the goodness of God in the moment over against fear, which is the feeling of anxiety over possible evil in the future. The more grateful you are, the more you realize how good your life with God is and the more you grow in your faith in God. Third, get around people of faith. There is a social dimension to faith. Some environments decrease our faith and others increase it. Jesus said of his home village that he could do no great miracles there because of their lack of faith. Living in a city like Vancouver or LA is very hard on your faith, hence the need to gather together. Finally, ask God for more faith, like the man in the story. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. He's praying for more faith. God, give me more faith. Faith is a muscle that we develop, but theologically, it's also a gift that we receive by the Spirit and the grace of God. And finally, just, as the second finally, sorry, one more, just wait. One of the greatest signs that we have faith is the ability to calmly wait for God to move to live through our wilderness with peace. But then there's passive spirituality, what scripture calls the test of faith. But this isn't like a test in school in the Western system where you study hard, and if you do a really good job, if you're smart and you work hard, you get a good grade. It's more like a, a stress test, the way engineers test a plane or a car or a new piece of technology or where a, a blacksmith tests the metal or a chef tests a dish, or a band tests out a new song on a live audience. It's a way to test the integrity or strength or quality of something, to see what it's actually made of. How much strain can it take? Is it ready for the next level? Less for God. He already knows what's in our heart, but often more for us. We often don't know. When our faith is tested, as it regularly is, what we actually believe comes to the surface of our heart. We may think that we don't need a lot of money to be happy until we lose our job. We may think that we don't get our identity from success in our career until we get demoted. We may think that I don't need to be married to be happy until we're single year over year over year. We may think my marriage isn't where I get my happiness from until we go through divorce or a tragedy. We may think that we love our children just the way they are until, shocking, they do not follow our pre-written script for their life. And then we are angry and afraid. Then what we actually believe comes to the surface. But only through tests. There's a theologian I read who writes about three levels of belief. There's public belief, which is what we say we believe, which is whatever people are saying online we're supposed to believe. Then there's private belief, which is what we think we believe. Then there's what he called a core belief, which is what we actually believe, but most of us don't realize it until it's tested. It's this stuff. Pain, suffering, disappointment, letdown will, will reveal to you and to me what we actually believe. 
Our family went through a very painful experience recently. Um, I have to keep this ambiguous to honor a few other people, but we had a dream that had been in our heart for decades, a city that we were in the process of moving to, a work that we were in the process of getting ready to do. And it was, it was a dream for me. It was a dream of two decades come true. And then um, at the last minute, I mean last minute, all of our plans for our future fell through and in a heartbreaking way. And the dream died. I mean, died a thousand deaths. And all through the discernment process over the last number of years, I remember I would pray pretty much every day, God, your will be done. And I thought I meant that prayer. I, I really thought that I, that was my heart. Until my faith was tested. And I realized, oh, I, I don't really want whatever God has for us. I want this particular thing on this particular timeline in this particular way. And the moment that was in jeopardy, I was stricken by fear. And when my fears came true, and it was my worst fears that came true, when it fell apart, I was, sh I was traumatized. And it has called for a whole new brutal level of self-awareness and with it a new level of surrender. And that is really what following Jesus is about. If you, if you had to put it into, you can't put it into one word, but man, surrender would be at least a good possible option. How do we cooperate with God in times of testing? We surrender. We let go of our attachments or our idols. We still have our desires, but we let go at an emotional level of our need for desires to come to pass. In a culture where everything is about control, we give up that futile attempt to control what we cannot possibly control. And then we just stay faithful to Jesus as he has been faithful to us, even when we are in what the biblical writers call the wilderness. We all go through the wilderness. Some of you here are in it this morning. The rest of you will be in it soon. Key to the wilderness is Psalm 23. Though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. It's just to keep walking. People give up on God way too soon. Do you hear nothing else from me this morning? One of the main roles of the wilderness is to strip us of the illusion of control and set us free from what's actually the root cause of all of our anxiety that causes us to behave in incredibly unloving ways. And really the only way for that to happen for most of us is not by reading another book or hearing another sermon. It's by having our control over the life we want stripped away from us against our will. That's basically the only way I know of where we get free. Lots of people are like, oh God, give me less anxiety. Be careful what you pray for. <laughs> what we want is like a zap from heaven. Most of the time, God's answer to that prayer is the wilderness. None of us want to go through it and Every single one who stays faithful to God looks back on it with gratitude, not bitterness. It says, God, thank you. Because not only did you bring me through, you set me free. And this just shows spiritual formation, I'll just end here, is so warped by the individualism of our culture. It so quickly becomes a Christian version of Project Self. Like, how do I just make my life better? It's almost like Christian wellness. Like, some people have spas and mindfulness apps. We have Jesus, okay, and Sabbath. And that's not all bad. Holistic, spiritual, for sure. But ultimately, it puts us face to face with the reality that we cannot save ourselves. That we need to be saved. And I don't mean that just in the very narrow evangelical understanding of that word, where your eternal destiny is switched. I mean that in the historic, biblical sense of that word, where your whole person is all that you are, body, soul, spirit, past, present, future, is saved, rescued, 
healed, made whole, renewed by the power of Jesus. We can't do that. Only Jesus can do that. But what we can do is keep walking. We can just stay faithful to Jesus as he is always faithful to us, but he is faithful on his timeline, not ours. In his way, not ours. And that may feel like bad news, but I'm telling you, that's really good news. Such good news. Because on the other side of the wilderness isn't just a better life and a deeper faith and a calmer nervous system. It's a greater experience of the mystery that is God. It never grows old. We never get tired. It's coming to a place where life is what life is but God is God. It's Job. Now my eyes have seen you. I'm done. So let's stand together and like Job, let's just be quiet for a moment. <coughs> Holy Spirit, come. As we just wait for a moment in the quiet, We open to you. Holy Spirit, come and settle on our heart as we process your word to us.